We're here today at the McCabe's Crystal Creek grazing property for a workshop about managing pasture and cattle in the drought. This is the second workshop in our Small Farms Big Changes series with support from New South Wales Government's Environmental Trust. Whilst the land behind me here looks quite green, we're actually in one of the driest years on record. This part of the Tweed local government area has had a thousand millimetres below the long-term average. This is putting a great deal of pressure on our graziers and also the environment. Fortunately, there are a number of short and long-term strategies available for our cattle graziers, and we'll be exploring these today with support from North Coast Local Land Services and New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. Um, I've been here all my life, um, so I've been here, out here working with the farm for over 30 years as, a, as an adult, but obviously as a kid, did it as a kid as well with the family because it's a family business and um, yeah, so mum and dad have been going at it for about 50 years out here, all their lives as well. Dad's 78 now and mum's over 70 as well, so they're the right hand and left hand man. All up we look after about over 500 herd of cattle, plus calves, whatever calves are at the time. At the moment there's a bit under 300 calves at the moment we've got, running about 20 bulls. And, uh, and there's clients too, I look after other people's cattle uh, as well as, as our own. Any, any weather's challenge, like, you know, we get everything up here. Like, as you know, we get, we get floods, we get rain, we get, um, we get the droughts and stuff and they come and flow and it's just part and parcel of it, it's just farming. You've just got to deal with it as it comes. So we've started to back off now, we've been good, we haven't had to feed cattle, um, but that's just moving cattle back and forth around the Tweed in different paddocks, allowing other paddocks to have a spell, uh, then work other paddocks hard, and then go, go back and forth that way. So I haven't had to feed, like I said, but we, um, we are starting to downsize a little bit now, but hopefully that rain will come in February and that'll kick this place on. So have you got any advice for other graziers around the Tweed? strategies for how they can manage I just the look at the paddock yeah I just really suss the paddock out like I'm sure Carol she'll be talking and even Nathan will be talking about how to measure your grass and stuff I think I've done enough over the years that I can I know my paddocks and I know what they can and can't handle but it's just a matter of just getting out and feeling your paddock and, uh, and letting her know she'll let you know what's going on yeah with your pasture in drought, the biggest thing, the biggest take home message from this is to protect your ground cover. So your ground cover isn't just for, is it, it's not just now, it's going to help you future proof yourself. Because ground cover that gets low now has a compounding effect. The first, the first effect of low ground cover is that when it rains, that low ground cover is just left you open for weeds to germinate. Uh, Low ground cover also increases your risk of erosion and low ground cover also means that you're going to have less carbon inputs into your soil. So your soil's going to go down a bit and we see some paddocks through a drought that start to go on a downward spiral where there's soil carbon being run down. So ground cover, really important. The, that's the external thing, but ground cover is really important for the plants because if the plants have leaf left, so when it does rain, they've got the solar panels ready to go. Whereas if it's basically gone down to stalk, uh, then we've got problems. Or oh, bracken. Yeah. How many of you got bracken? Yeah. Uh, in a normal year, don't touch bracken. In a year like this, when feed's getting short, they'll start to have a little munch on the bracken. The most poisonous part of the bracken is the, uh, the newly emerged fronds. Luckily, that needs a bit of rain to trigger that. But if you have short on feed, the bracken will come out faster than your pasture and you might suddenly get some toxicity. The actual break of rain is one of the most dangerous times for you guys with your cattle because, they're, because of the poisonous plants suddenly get a spurt but the pastures are a bit slower and so some of them will be eaten. Uh, so and then the invasive ones like your giant rat's tail grass and your giant parramatta grass, the big, the big problem with that is that, yeah, they, they're space invaders. But uh, I was at a property at Maxville uh, on Monday and they put out a lot of that. You, you, last time you had Jeremy here with his... Um, soil trooper. 
with his soil trooper. I was trying to remember what it's called now, the soil trooper. Uh, they put a lot out and they said, well, it's all been a waste of time because it's been a drought. And I, and I actually went through and found him some plants with, um, with the fungus, but you can't see the orange stem, but when you, you can actually pull it out by the roots and there's orange roots there. And so, so it isn't a waste of time, it's just we can't see it, it's not spreading particularly well, it, it'll still be there. And hopefully when it does rain, parameter grass will be curved a bit by that for the... So just remember, when we do get the rain and you see paddocks like Clint's got this paddock here, it'll be very responsive, it's got the green, good coverage there already. It becomes very tempting, people run cattle out of bush paddocks or wherever they've had them hiding, throw them straight onto real lush feed. Think about what been, they've been eating, their stomach, their system takes about three weeks to a month for a cattle's, the bugs in their stomach to fully adapt to the diet they're on. You run them out of supplement, hay, lady grass, licks, grain, whatever, and throw them straight onto real lush coquilla or any pasture, you can roll them and people often go, oh it was a bloat or I don't know what happened. Sometimes an extreme diet change can trigger some illnesses and things as well. So, and often nitrate's one, they've come, cattle will build an adaption to nitrate, but if they've been off on something else and come straight down to a real lush pasture, people think, oh, I must have bladed them, could have been nitrate that rolls them. Um, yeah, and pulpy kidney, pulpy kidney always give them. Things that's, um, so just often, Kikuyu point, that's one of the, the things that they're often cattle that have been killed have come into paddocks, haven't seen Kikuyu for a while. Um, Ceteria is another one, the oxalates in Ceteria, when it really becomes lush and takes off. Um, so think about just introducing a few hours on a lush paddock and then push them back off. It'll be hard to do, but just think about what they've come from before you go and just open the gate and let them, let them go and do. Uh, the next one is biosecurity. There's a really big risk of weeds, whether it's the weeds on your own property or the weeds coming in with seed. And we've got different weeds coming from different... Um, States. For instance, there's hay coming in from South Australia at the moment. Uh, so we've got uh, weeds that are particular to there. We've got feed coming from Tamworth region, so that's mostly going inland now, but some of that's got Passons Curson. There's resistance weeds coming in, possibly. But we also got stuff coming in from Queensland, so we've got the possibility of things like fire ants as well coming in with feed. So it's the vigilance of the feed that you get, but also using a sacrifice paddock system or a quarantine paddock so that you're going to have all those weeds contained in one area where you can find them. Now that sacrifice paddock should be a good paddock so that you don't, um, to, so that you're able to fix it up afterwards. The third take home message is that after the drought breaks, we're gonna need vigilance because there's going to be weeds coming up in places you've never seen. There's also gonna be weeds coming up that you've never seen before. So guys, what you've just been handed out is a, a, is a fodder budgeting tool. Where it's a, there are apps out there now that you can put some numbers in, but they only give you, they're only worth what you put in, knowing what you put in. Uh, this little guy is called a pasture ruler, the MLA. We've got some up there, but you can get them from the MLA. Anyone who sells cattle uh, pays an MLA levy so you can get their resources and ask them to send you stuff. Most of their stuff is free. Uh, so um, I've got to put a rider on it. This pasture ruler is much better for ryegrass than it is for kikuyu. Uh, or you could do the boot test. So uh, just looking around here, anybody wearing high heels, this doesn't work, but uh, how, how many of you wear high heels into the paddock? So uh, that. that first part, the first, the heel of your boot, is 1,000 kilos of feed in your paddock. So if the pasture is coming up to the heel of your boot, that's 1,000 kilos. In Kikuya, everything, it, in Kikuya, in this area, doesn't work in the hunter because Kikuya doesn't grow as well. Uh, Kikuya in this area, every finger width is approximately another 1,000 kilos of feed. Uh, per hectare. Per hectare, yep. Uh, so if I, you know, if, I, if the feed's up to here, but we're only looking at the green feed, the green component of the feed. Uh, now, on that, uh, have you got a spare one? <laughs> on that, so, uh, thank you. 
We could, you know, there's two questions there. How many days will this paddock last a specific number of stock? Well, that's question two on one side. So it's saying number of stock, however many you've got in the paddock, and then the paddock size, that's fairly obvious what you put in there, but you've got to convert it to hectares to make it work. It says present green herbage mass from your pasture assessment. Now Nathan's going to talk about the cutting method. Are you going to talk about the cutting method? I wasn't going, I thought you would, I took that slide out of my All oh, right, that's right. Yeah, so the cutting method is if I put a, nut, a quadrat down, quadrat, and I actually cut it right down to the ground, I take it back home and I put it in the microwave and I dry it out. There's two things to caution you about doing this. One is, if you do it, don't do it around your children or your grandchildren and they're going to school, as my daughter did. She, she gave us news that day that mum was cooking grass in the microwave. Uh, so caution there. Um, the, the other one is that you can uh, make your microwave explode if, and <laughs> if you don't do it with a bit of water in there. So if you're drying it out, you gotta turn it regularly, but also have a, keep on changing a cup of water in there. Otherwise it can run out of moisture and then the microwave just goes. I've only done it twice. Uh, yeah, you, uh, well, you're trying to get rid of all the moisture uh, because because you're measuring the dry matter, not the amount of moisture. You don't want to be confused by the moisture. So, no, living in the sun on a 45 degree day would probably work, but not um, not on a day like this. Hmm? You can use low heat oven, but uh, my husband set fire to the paper bag that it was in in the low heat oven. So, yeah. Yeah, there are special, you know, in the research stations, they have special dehydrators they put it in and they 60 degrees for, 20, for 48 hours. Uh, but you don't want to spend that much on electricity on it. So the microwave is probably the fastest way to do it. And then uh, there is a calculation you do and you can work out how much, it all depends on the size quadrat you used. And you can work out how many uh, kilos per hectare that you've got. So we work out how much is there. Nathan and I just had a quick conflab. We thought there was two, about 2,500 kilos per hectare of feed in that paddock, of green feed in that paddock. But we want to leave about 1,000 kilos. So that's the residual herbage mass that's on the next line there. So we want to leave 1,000 kilos or even 1,500 kilos in Kaikuyu. And the reason we want to leave that there, ground cover, but also have enough residue leaf so that we've got the solar panels to start it growing again. So that leaves us with 1,000 kilos of available pasture in here. Now, the next step in that question is pasture growth for a set time. Now, I've lost him. Eli's got these curves there. Eli's got some of these curves there. They're also available in that um, the book that Nathan brought, there's a, there's a copy of this in that book if you haven't grabbed it. What's the name of the book? Oh, the Cattle Health and Husbandry Guide. Yep, so it's got this curve here and you'll see it's got uh, growth curve. So you can actually work out the growth curve. Now this is assuming, this growth curve, that it rains. So let's assume that we're not going to get significant growth now because it hasn't rained that much. If, it, if, it, if we had a hell of a fall, It'd be growing 60, Kaku would be growing at um, 60 kilos a day at the moment. But as we just heard Clint saying, it's not doing anything like that. The biggest deficiency is rainfall. Uh, so if we said there was no feed, so we're saying it's growing at, um, it's, it's, we're going to say there's no growth, or very little, so we're not going to count it. Now the intake of animals per day, you got any idea how much a 500 cow 500 cow, 500 kilogram cow eats a day if the feed quality is high enough. No, yep, yep. They eat 3% of their body weight, approximately 3% of their body weight a day. Uh, 500 kilo cow, that is 15 kilos. And we're not talking wet feed, we're talking dry matter feed. So how many of you bought hay recently? Uh, how much is it a bale? No, no. How much? How much? How many dollars for a bale? Oh, we're just buying small bales, six bucks a kilo. Six bucks a bale, sorry. Huh? 
170 a ton. Yep. Big round bales. Well, let's let's go for the small bales at the moment. There, if you make them yourself, those those little square bales are about 25 kilos. If you make them for yourself to use, if you make them to sell somebody else, they're about 18 kilos. Uh, so you always make them a bit lighter when you're selling them. Uh, so uh, 18 kilos. So that is 18 to 20 kilos is the average for a small bale. So that is three quarters of those uh, one of those bales per cow per day if the feed quality was high enough for them to be able to utilize it and um, that's a, that's why i asked you how much it costs you because that's a pretty scary thought when you multiply it by the number of cows you got uh, so if we do that we say whenever they're out here there they spoil it as you know they won't eat around the cow pats unless they're really really hungry they won't eat around the urine patches unless they're really, really hungry. As you walked across, you saw the very dark green circles. They were mostly urine patches. You know, your, that your supplement's got too much protein in it if, if they've killed it in that patch. Any of you got female dogs and they're killing the lawn at the moment? Yeah, that's too much protein in their diet. So, um, same thing. Ah. Uh, I'm trying to get my dogs onto low protein feed at the moment, but they don't like it. Uh, so we can work this out. We can work then how much long this would um, for the stock. So we, we can work out the total stock requirements in taking sp spoilage over that time. So if we give um, 15 kilos plus a bit of spoilage, let's make it 18. Let's make it 18 kilos. So the available pasture was 1,000 divided by, so who's got their calculator out? We'll get one out. You'll get one out. Right so we got 1,000 kilos plus the amount of growth. We said it's not growing, so zero. So 1,000 divided by I, which is? The 18 kilos, that's the what they're eating plus spoilage. 55.5. 50, 55. 55.5, that is um, available pasture plus growth divided by stock requirements means that we could run them. One cow that, for one, that hectare for 55 days. That's it, one cow for that hectare. Uh, so, uh, or we could work out the number of stocks that we could run on the whole area. Now, one of the th one of the things that this doesn't take into account is the way pastures grow. Uh, the kaikuyu, the soil is a runner grass, so it can cope with being set stock, having cows on it all the time. Uh, but it doesn't grow to its maximum potential because you keep on removing those solar panels. So you can get more feed out of a pasture like this if you subdivide it and just rest it. Whether it's subdividing it into two paddocks, three paddocks. I was talking to someone the other day and they were saying that <laughs> but the electric fences aren't working anymore because it's, the soil's too dry to ground them. So, uh, uh, so that makes it a bit harder. Permanent infrastructure on a, a flat like this would be a bit problematic with a flood coming through and uh, ruining it all for you, but you could run the same number of stock and actually get more feed from your kaikuyu if it was rested. How long would you rest it for? That's a very good question. Uh, so, uh, so kaikuyu, when it's hot enough, uh, will be put its five leaves up within 14 days. So you're not resting them very long. You can, but now those of you who've got Rhodes grass, it's it needs a longer rest. Does anyone grow loosen around here? Yeah. So it needs at least used to. Used to. At least 30 days rest. If you don't give it 30 days rest, it'll disappear on you. Uh, chicory. It's a 30 day rest plant. Anyone who got plantain in? It's 14 days. It's perfect for kaikuyu. The carpet grasses and the coochies. Now, all of those guys uh, have um, those horizontal stems, whether they're rhizomes under the ground or they're stolons, and they're able to root from there. And that's where their energy store is, in that stem. So when we graze them, 
we, uh, we have that energy for the plant to take off again and put its new solar panels up. When we're talking rhodes grass or cesarea, so it's um, rhodes grass and cesarea, they tend to have the energy store in the t in about the bottom five to seven centimetres. That's where the energy store is. So if we graze them too low, we're taking some of that energy store, which is they're using to put the new leaves up. So with uh, rhodes grass, if we set stock rhodes grass or soteria, and it ke keeps on getting this eaten all the time, it runs out of the energy store that it needs. So the energy store is basically where the energy comes from to put up the first leaf after grazing. So, le so leaving, we say with soteria, you manage it between your ankle, so you leave as much as where your ankle is to give plenty of energy for it to come back and leave a few leaf panels left up to your knee and after your knee its quality goes down so you graze it down again. So that's the sort of range. The same applies to rhodes grass. It does, some of the rhodes grass have quite a lot of these stolons but it still has a lot of energy in that crown area. Now for those of you who, so, so to do that, I've had people before who sown Soteria, I was on one property and he said, I sowed Soteria, it was absolutely useless, it disappeared off the property in two years. And I said, so how many paddocks have you got? And he goes, one. Uh, he never gave it a rest. So it came up, it did quite well, uh, and then it, he wiped it out. I actually, we thought completely, we put a trial, we put an exclusion zone on in there. And in that zone, these huge terrier plants appeared over time because it was cattle were excluded. And he goes, well, how did you do that? And I went, we closed the gate. Uh, we gave it a rest and gave it the ability to come back. Uh, so it's really important with the tussock grasses not to chew them down too far. The best way to do that is to have some sort of rotational grazing system. If you're already down this low um, now, then that's the time when we're talking about ground cover and leaving plants in, the, in enough state to have recovery. So it's time to move them somewhere else if you've already eaten into that zone so that when the rain does come, it's got the ability to come back. Uh, and the easiest way, though, is to rotationally graze. Well, one, one of the things with, with rotational grazing at these times, I have some people who just throw all the fences open because they go, I am sick of feeding the ruse because uh, that bit grows back. And that's where the ruse are and their cattle are over there. Uh, so rotational grazing will only work as long as something, because the rest period is about its recovery, the plant's recovery time. If there's been no rain, it's not recovering, then the rotational grazing falls down just like that stocking falls down. So it's time to think about those sacrifice paddocks. Look, I'll start with just how extreme the drought is. Um, this is only a snippet of our region, North Coast. To give you an idea of how rapidly dare I say it, the conditions are deteriorating. So here's obviously our north coast region. You can keep a track of these maps on the New South Wales DPI if you just Google up Drought Hub or Drought New South Wales. Um, you can jump in there. There's a whole swag of information um, around animal management, but also drought conditions, available assistance measures, all of those types of things. So that's the Drought Hub. But basically this map, I put this slide in last week. It says that there's 81.9% of the north coast is in what they class now as intense drought. In the last week that's deteriorated, we're now 83% classed as intense drought, 100% of the north coast region. So from Port Macquarie to the border is basically drought affected now. Um, and you can see by the red as we go to our counterparts in the tablelands and you keep going rest, they just become red, intense drought. So some of what I'm talking about as we go forward, obviously has an impact on the cattle market, feed supply, um, that you know we're well in the throes of having to battle with those who've been doing it for quite a while out in the tablelands. But just so you're aware that it's well and truly here, and as a result of that, everyone's individual um, circumstances are going to be a lot different. And what I mean by that is, some of us have been fortunate enough to get under little showers at different times throughout the year. Um, a lot of us 
have different financial streams or income sources that can change our management decisions opposed to what others will do. So overall, just because you see a neighbour or hear someone doing something, may or may not be the best idea in your situation, maybe the absolute right idea for them, um, maybe something that you should look at. But just bear in mind that you know, there's no one golden approach to managing a season like we're seeing at the moment. And that's why I'm very big on, if you haven't already done it, and I'm sure most of you will have, we can only manage what you've got in front of us today. And by that, when I say do a stock take, all of us are brilliant at looking at the cattle and feed and water reserves on the property, but biggest one, please look at your finances. And a lot of people get a bit depressed at the moment with the current cattle market, but check the cash flow budget, um, especially for those that are thinking about feeding or continuing to feed. Because for a lot of us, and especially down Casino, Upper Clarence, the cash flow budget's making their decisions within an hour or so as to what they're gonna do coming forward, especially this time of year. Think about your anticipated herd structure, the condition they're in, what pasture do you have available, what condition is it in, um, is it in as Carol mentioned, Stocks of conserved feed. Very few people in the North Coast have conserved feed, hay or silage or grain or anything left. Most of us, if we're feeding, we're looking to buy it in now. Um, I'll talk about availability. Um, well, availability of purchased grains and supplements. Um, don't just expect to front up your rural store as we may normally have done, or feed supplier and, and source product. There can be short, anything from a short weight to a flat out. We can't supply that or we can't source that. Um, and a big one for a lot of people now is water. Um, just have a long, hard think about what water you've got on the property, how's it supplied, um, especially in the next coming weeks uh, as the sale yards and processes begin to shut down, you, you know, as it heats up, stock water requirements increase, more pressure on those water reserves, you don't want to find yourself in the situation of we've run out of water. Um, give you an idea, adult cow with a calf, 100 litres a day you've got to allow her 100 litres a day. So very quickly we start to multiply out, we're talking thousands of litres of water a day. Weaner yearling, anywhere from 30 to 50 litres a day. Um, under that the kind of weather conditions we're going to be running into. So think about the amount of stock you've got and what that water supply is looking for. So talking a bit about the um, pasture conditions, I guess the biggest thing is here, is I really want to reiterate, everyone's situation is different. Um, there's some people that were fortunate enough to still have irrigation um, light or ability to still pump water. Um, unfortunately, a lot of that is beginning to cease or in some areas, salt water's encroaching up our river systems far that they're now on cease to pumps. Um, the water in and around Korokai, if anyone knows that area, um, is now nearly equivalent to the ocean. So anyone who pumps or irrigates from that area, um, it's just because we're not getting the flow of water out. Um, but anyway, again, just think about, you know, what cattle you've got on farm, the condition they're in, again, the finances, the ability to source feed and handle feeding. But one of the comments I've heard so frequently over the last few years is, it'll all be fine when we, if we just get some normal rainfall, everything's gonna be fine. I'm not saying that it's not going to definitely help, but it makes me say, well, what is normal rainfall? Now, if we have a look here, and all I've done is gone to the Bureau of Meteorology and dug up two old, uh, well, there's Wollombar Post Office rainfall records because they go right back to 1890 through to early 70s, and then Wollombar, the Bray Park Station, because it goes from 75 more or less through the modern day. Now, these gaps, there was no validated data, so they wasn't, there was no rain, but there was just no validated data. What I want to get across to you all, what do we think when we look at that? That's the annual rainfall from Wollombar. And I know our properties aren't all that Wollombar, but just think about, what do we think of those graphs? They bounce up and down all over the place, don't they? Everyone agree? Be very hard to see, but on the handouts, through it about this point here, so probably about that 1300 mil, is the median rainfall, is what they call a median. All that is, is based on all these records, they put a line through and say out of the, since 1890 through to 1970 in this case, 
50% of the years we got more than 1,300 mil, 50% of the years we got less. So when you sit there and look at it, that says to me, when someone says, oh, if we just get normal rainfall, we'll be right. If you were a farmer that took over the running of the farm, let's say from 1970 on, through to your idea of normal rainfall might be, gee, it, it always rains, it's really wet. If you're someone who took over the farm, for example, the early 2000s or just bought country then, when it was obviously below median or drier, you might say, oh, well, yeah, it's, it's dry, but, you know, we've seen it dry. So the biggest take-home message to me when we say, oh, if we just get normal rainfall, normal rainfall is variable. The, someone's perception of what is normal rainfall is largely probably going to reflect their experience or time spent on that property or what they associate um, to a certain time period as far as rains, floods and that type of thing. So I guess just saying, oh, if we get normal rainfall, it'll all be fine. I'm someone I like to come back to, well, what, what can we use from some data to see what's that going to look like? So basically, I've just taken the Bray Park, so from 72 to 18. How can we use that rainfall to try and give us an idea of, well, if we get normal rainfall, whatever that opinion may be, what's that going to look like for pasture recovery? Basically, here we are, 1st of December, or start of December. So from a woolen bar, typically, the median, rain, whoop, median rainfall for December is 151 mil. So out of all the year's worth of records, 50% of the time we get 100, over 150 mil, 50% of the time we don't get 150 mil. Thinking about your properties right now, if we get 150 mil, certainly will help, no doubt, but just think about what would that mean for you? Is that 150 mil going to be your get out of jail for the cow herd completely? Remember, 50% of years we haven't achieved 150 mil. Um, you know, how many of you in November got 120 mil? Anyone? Well, according to records, it, you know, 50% of the years we get 120 mil or more, 50% of the years, and here we are, we haven't got that. So I'll come to the slide shortly because it's very hard to see up here, but start thinking about now, obviously, our weather's warmed up. So Temperatures are going to be right for our pastures to grow, being tropical species, but obviously water or rainfall is now our most limiting factor. And I'll start to tie this all together. The other thing, again, and I, I don't want to sound like it's negative, but in dealing with people that have found themselves in very uncomfortable circumstances in the drought, whether you like it or not, there, are, uh, there is the Bureau of Meteorology, whether you believe in them or not, or you've got different weather prediction models, they have a lot more money and knowledge than old Jimmy Smith down the back that says because a crow's landed here, it's going to rain on 14th of November and so forth. Bureau put this out, and it's the chance of exceeding median rainfall between December this year and February 2020. You can't really see that colour there, but basically they're giving us between a 30 and 35% chance of obtaining median rainfall. So if I just jump back quickly, so we've got 150 plus 165 to 300 odd mil, they're saying we've got 30% chance of getting that. They're basically saying you've got 70% chance you won't obtain your median rainfall between there and February. So again, thinking about your farm, the pasture, the cow herd you've got, how far into feeding programs you're in, what is that going to look like for you moving forward if that eventuates? I, I really hope that does turn out to be wrong, but I think you start laying it what history's told us. All these maps, you can look this up, um, the Bureau of Meteorology, climate outlooks for, for our particular regions, but it has a considerable impact on our pasture recovery and therefore ability to supply feed to the cow herd. Pasture is and will always remain the cheapest source of feed you can supply to a cow herd, especially a beef breeding operation. So here's Carol's pasture curve, slightly modified because we've got the actual guide to kgs of dry matter per hectare per month down the bottom. What I'd like to do is, when we overlay that, again, based on data that's been recorded, temperature, rainfall impact, we start to get what I've called decision days about 
What are we going to do if this hasn't eventuated? The first one, by rights, based on the records and conditions that tropical pastures need to grow and or commence growth, really decision day one is back the start of October. By then we should be seeing our tropical pastures going green if we've had the rainfall. So I'm saying, what I'm saying is if you get the start of October and they're not, really, we're not, they're not going green, lack of rainfall and still potentially minimum night or low, minimum daily temperatures are growth restricting factors for our pasture to begin to recover. So often you'll get rainfall, they'll go green and people say, oh, they're still a bit slow. That's because minimum temperatures are a growth limiting factor at that point. You can see as our pasture growth curves really start to move on, if you look at decision day two, in my opinion, is really the mid, mid of November through to December. And what I'm saying is by then, typically, especially in the tweed, minimum temperatures are often above 13 to 15 degrees at night, so there's no real tem temperature limitation on pasture. That tells us one thing, rainfall is the most limiting factor if we're not seeing adequate growth. Because typically, from this time of year, you normally, you'd be battling grass, wouldn't you, Clint, this time of year, up here, in a, in a, a normal year, whatever normal is? So, exactly, slashing. So I sit there and look and say, well, decision day two for me, my own enterprise, but from the north coast, is that I go middle of November. I should be seeing obvious pasture growth. If I'm not seeing obvious pasture growth here, I certainly, where I am, there was nothing decision day one. It was like, well, what am I going to do? Because as these days begin to creep across, so we haven't gone green until about now, we're going to run out of time to grow feed before next winter. And I'll come to that. Decision day three, between the mid and end of February. So through January, February, as we come into that um, time of year, generally, generally rainfall should be non-limiting. Historical records suggest rainfall should be non-limiting from pasture production. Temperature's adequate. We should, again, be battling grass. That's usually the time of year we've got too much grass, not enough cattle to be able to eat it. But if you get to there, so for example, we're only just down Casino Way, we still haven't even gone green. So this green point, decision day one, that means if we don't go green until somewhere here, or those of you who don't have the, the flat country, if you're still not going green, even when we, if we get rain, say the end of December, we're starting to come into, well here, Decision day four, minimum temperatures start to restrict us regardless of how much rainfall we've got. So all I'm saying is the longer we go before we go green, that means it's longer before the pasture really begins to have the solar panels and ability to really grow and bulk up feed. Eventually, and it's usually about the end of April, probably middle of May for you guys up here in the Tweed, minimum temperatures start to become a growth limiting factor. It gets too cool for our tropical grasses. So what I'm saying is think about already or each and every year think about the impact of we're going to end up with a restricted gr pasture grow growing season what's that going to mean for next winter spring we've got to get there first i know for those of who are feeding but i'm just trying to highlight that to me is key decision days and they're based around when you look at minimum temperatures rainfall and then you overlay with these pasture growth curves that people that were way smarter than me developed years ago in DPI, they actually align quite nicely and you can start to see the trends and the impact temperature and rainfall has. But in a drought situation, I'm just bring it back around. If you're someone who's heavily feeding at the moment and you're, you know, we're now at December, we've already missed, you know, a good couple of months of pasture recovery or growth. So even if we get that rain now, the pastures, we can't do it. It's not going to go to this high overnight like some people seem to think it could do. Um, it's got to recover. It's got to begin to grow. We've got to get the follow-up rainfall to continue to grow that feed. Otherwise, what's going to happen to us here? We could have an uncomfortable winter feed gap next year, unless, of course, you're someone who has the country or ability to plant feed. People say to me, well, in some cases, what is alive? There's some country I'm dealing with, the paddocks are brown and have been for a long time. Anything that's there, there's not a green tinge in sight. I call it very practical, I call it the twist and pull test. If you crouch down to a, 
a plant and you're in that situation, obviously if, if it's green, it's indicating it's alive. You crouch down and grab a little plant, if you can just gently twist and pull it out, it's dead. It's, it's finished. There's survival roots are gone. You're going to be, in that case, reliant on seed coming back from the soil seed bank or if there are some bigger, deep-rooted plants um, that are still there. If you pull it and twist and pull and it's, there's a little bit of resistance, its survival roots or the secondary roots will keep it anchored. They're going to have some ability to recover when we do get rainfall. Um, they're going to be very vulnerable to that continued set stocking. Cattle roaming over the top of them, they get a bit of a shower of rain, they start to go green, cattle come along, whoop, I'll take that green leaf off. So they're the paddocks that you really want to be thinking about. Where do we put the cattle when we do get the rain to allow that pasture time to recover and get up and get going? And in your case, as we said before, if you pull and it comes straight out, think about those paddocks as far as well they're basically going to be reliant on the soil seed bank or do I have to consider renovating in those paddocks? Um, around here, where it's nowhere near as bad, there is a lot of country in our district that is virtually at that point of, it's more or less all dead, so recovery is going to be slow. Another good trick, if you want to know what in the world is likely to come back, a litre, if you measure out a square metre, a litre of water per square metre is the equivalent, the equivalent to one mil of rain. So if you tip 25 litres on a square metre, that's like 25 mil of rain. So if you did that over the same area a um, couple of times a week, but again, and see what begins to recover, that'll give you an indication of, is it tropical grass from plants that are still there? Is it stuff germinating from seeds, any weeds? Um, the biggest thing I'll say with that is use a realistic amount of water. Um, especially this time of year, minimum temperatures aren't going to impact us, but there's no point putting 300 um, litres out there if you're not likely to get anywhere near that amount of rain. So use a, a realistic amount of rainfall you would expect. Um, it's just a handy way to get an indication as to what is going to come back and how quickly that can, can occur. So that brings us around to, for some, decision time. Sell versus feed for beef cattle. There's a couple of really good tools. There's a drought and supplementary feed calculator, the DPI I've developed. You can, that's available as a desktop version now or also on an app for your iPhones, iPads, smartphones, etc. It's great, it gives you really good ability to make your own feed rations or, or mixtures. Um, like any computer model, crap in, crap out. Um, if you lie to it, it'll lie to you. So again, be realistic. Um, there's an inbuilt feed library in that. So if you've come across a supplementary feed that you haven't heard of, like or a rural retailer or someone has it, um, chances are it'll be in there. It'll give you a guide to the energy protein levels. It'll also give you a warning. If you make up a mixture that you're gonna feed your cattle X, Y, Z ingredients, if it's not adequate in energy protein or it's toxic in various things, it'll give you a red flag as a warning to let you know you can't feed that much of that particular item or it won't meet the nutritional demands of that class of animal. Um, been helping a lot of people use that. Um, likewise, this one has been having too much of a workout this year. I've got, if anyone would like it, it's an Excel, basically just an Excel sheet. Um, blue, blue text is data entry. Virtually it enables you to do, based on what you're paying for feed, the stock you've got on hand, um, talk to your agent to get an indication of what the stock are worth. You can run through a series of calculations and it'll tell you, are you better off selling those cattle now or attempting to hold and feed them? Biggest thing I'll stress with these, these tools are just decision support tools. So what I mean is that'll help you make a decision, but they do not factor in the cash flow of the business. In some cases, a scenario might say, oh, you're $500 ahead, better to hold and feed, but if you don't have the cash flow ability to pay that feed bill or those invoices to get through until that point in time, then it's not the right decision. So it's just a, a bit of a, they help you make a decision, but always cross-check that with your cash flow budget to see what things are looking like there. If you're planning to feed, always think margin over feed cost. And if I hear another agent say this, cows will be worth gold or you'll never afford them again, I feel like I want to strangle them. Because, or the better response to them is, well, do you want to pay my feed bill between now and that point in time? 
because 50%, 100%, 200% market increase, let's hope so, quite, could quite easily get in the realm of that. But if you've got a cow and she's worth $800 now, 100% increase, she's a $1,600 cow. Okay? Sounds good. But it all depends on what's the cost you've got to endure to keep and feed her through to that point in time. That's what you've really got to say. The question you need to ask yourself when someone you hear these statements is, can I afford to keep them until it rains and the pastures recover? There's a lot of people, and that's very individual circumstance, and that's why I'm not running through a, a calculated feeding scenario with everyone here today, because what works for one person may not work for someone else. You need to look at these things in a bit of an individual basis. Example is, um, look at this top one, $800 cow now, Let's say the market jumps 50% and she becomes worth uh, 1,200, 50% increase. If I've got to spend $5 a head a day, I'm going to spend $500 on her between, or in 100 days. So all of a sudden, she's a $1,300 cow. I only get that. I would have only got that 1,200 if I sold her. $100 still out backwards. So I guess, who knows? what the cattle market's going to do. Yeah, it'll increase for sure, but who knows where it'll go. My biggest thing is what you can control is how many you're feeding, what your feed cost per head per day is, and these are the big questions. What's your, what's your end game? How many are you feeding? How long have you been feeding? Many of you up here possibly haven't been feeding as long as some in other parts of our region, but I know dealing with one client down near Grafton, he's already in the cows for $1,100. He spent $1,100 per cow on feed. So you start looking at that. Now, they've got a business model. They, they've got a trading operation in the Tablelands that's been hemorrhaging money, and they're virtually that's now ceased because of the drought out there. But you start doing the numbers on that. They're a long way to recoup that money. Um, they just, just thought it would rain. They just kept going. They just thought it would rain. So just think about... And they'll, look, there'll be people out there that... And I've got those same similar clients that will say, uh, I can afford to feed it and that I can afford to feed them and hold them and that's fine. But just think about how long you're feeding and what margin is going to be in them at the other end. Um, people say, oh, well, I'll never, I'll never be able to buy them back. Well, if you... That $800 cow, if you spend... You know, $500, or it blows right out to be $1,000 a head for some people who are fully feeding because they're down to the tarmac. Um, that can happen within 100 days, depending on your feed costs. So you need to know your feed costs very quickly. All of a sudden, that $800 cow becomes an $1,800 cow. If you spend another $1,000 on it, were you better off? Or always consider, hang on, I sell a, sell a, take $800 now, I'll keep the $1,000 that it was going to cost me to feed her in the bank account. You can go back out and pay $1,800 and you're no worse off when you've got feed, if, if that's where the market goes. But margin over feed cost, because maintenance feeding over a long period of time becomes really, really expensive. Yeah, exactly right. And often those who have sold early get to find themselves in the position the pastures requ recover sooner. They can actually go back and buy back sooner before the real, real peak comes in and the prices really jump away. Good old calculator works well um, for calculating feed costs. Um, basically, it's as simple as the feed cost divided by the weight of feed in kilograms. That gives you the cost per kilo. This is an as-fed. Cost per kilo times by how many kilos you're feeding per day. Here's an example with hay at 500 a tonne. 500 by 1,000 kilos, 50 cents a kilo. 10 kilos a cow times 50 cents, $5 a cow a day. That quick, 100 days, $500. A lot of people have, rapid, that's, that's how it's rapidly, oh, we didn't realise it jumped away. Um, 
go for 200 days, $1,000 a head. So just an idea of, you know, that's how you can calculate feed costs because there's things coming in all different size products um, and weight wise. If you haven't already done it, most of us are breeding operations, even those who trade tend to trade in breeding cattle. Preg testing, probably the, if you haven't done it or are thinking about doing it, do it. The main reason is it allows for informed decision making. Biggest reason for that is it helps you decide what ones you might sell, what ones you might keep and feed. Um, feed allocation, um, a lot of people who are hand feeding, you know, the current costs of feed, why are you feeding a dry cow in a paddock with something that's about to drop a calf in a couple of months? Um, it's not the year for sacred cows. If you, if you are hand feeding anything, make sure they're productive. And by that, from a breeding point of view, they've got to be in calf, rearing a calf, feeding to keep them in condition to get them back in calf. I don't care if she had a good calf two years ago, She's, if she hasn't got a calf now and she's not joined and going to calve next year for you, well, she's not going to help you out financially next year either. So she may as well go on the truck to give you the cash flow to help feed the ones that are working for you. Um, that's what I mean by it's not the year for sacred cows. Um, and everyone's got them, oh, she, you know, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, it's hard to do, but at the end of the day, I look at it, you're running a business. Um, they have to earn their right to be there, um, especially if you're buying feed for them. Comes around to another thing, and I'll focus on this a little bit. The other most critical management tool you can look to employ is early weaning. Now, I'll talk about early weaning in general, and why we talk about that is basically it reduces the feed demand you've got on farm and I'll talk through that. But what is early weaning? It basically means weaning a calf before it's six to seven months of age. Beyond seven months, it's argued about how much benefit the calf gets from remaining on its mum, even in good conditions. Um, so we're talking early weaning now as we're taking them off as, as babies, when they by rights should really still remain with their mums if conditions would allow. Um, extreme cases, as young as six weeks old or 60 kgs, I'll talk about that specifically. But typically in our region, it's anything between three and five months old. Um, I've early weaned calves this year myself, as young as three months, majority about that five months of age. And why, why do it? Feeding the calf through a cow is ve very inefficient. So what I mean by that first point, if you're someone in the situation where you, you are feeding the cow-calf unit, as in hay or even hay and grain, and you're relying on that cow to eat the feed, convert it to milk to then feed the calf, it's not as efficient cost-wise as giving the calf the bit of feed it needs, reduce the energy demand for the cow, and I'll show you the example of that, to therefore she, you'd only have to feed her less than that unit combined. The reason being, the, yep. It still works out quite significantly cheap, and I've got an example coming up soon, so I'll run through that, and if I still haven't answered, jump on me and I'll go through again. Um, better allocation of limited feed resources. What we're meaning by that is a dry cow, she can get by on the, what they call the three sevens. Seven kilos of dry matter, 7% 7 protein, seven megajoules of energy, if she's not rearing, when she's completely dried off. You'll keep her alive. But again, think about if you're paying to feed that, you really want to hope she's back in calf. You don't want to just keep her dry and empty because she's going to earn you nothing next year either. Um, so that means that you can free up better quality feed for those, that heifer that might have had a calf or the heifers that are soon to calve, depending on your program. Or um, dry, So yeah, dry cows touched on that. They eat less, but the energy and protein content's reduced. Um, removing the calf, um, Helps recommence cycling, so depending on your program again, um, can aid in getting calf, cows back in calf. And that's all to do with the suckling stimulus of the calf on the cow, especially in our Bos indicus breeds. Has an impact, it's a hormonal impact, that basically in a tough year she'll go, oh, I'll, I'll shut down my reproductive system, I've got to look after myself and this calf first. Remove that suckling stimulus, 
there's a hormonal change, that can provide the feeds there or trigger to, to come back and commence cycling. Um, save water, cow calf unit will consume in excess of 110 to 20 litres per day. Lactation is a big water demand on the cow. Dry cow will come back to about 80 litres a day. Um, same weight, same size, it's just that need for water. Increased marketing, flexibility. Look, cattle market's pretty up in the air, depends who you talk to. Um, but in some cases, we've seen where people have weaned calves early, the cows still had condition on them, sold the cow, got good money for the cow, and have kept the calf um, to feed on because the weaned or the young calves aren't worth too much. Um, it's just coming up. I'll just postpone your, your restart message here, Eloy. Um, better utilise high quality pasture. What they mean by that is when it grows, you might be able to then allocate that to the more productive animals than a cow that's had a calf on for too long and ran herself right the way down. Um, so we'll talk through a couple of those things. Weaning the calf, it's the best supplement a cow can get. So here's an example. A cow needs at least 13, minimum 13 kilograms of dry matter per day to survive. And what we mean by that is, if provided, the energy is 8.4 megajoules per kilo and the protein level is 10%. That's min so she needs 110 megajoules of energy. She needs that minimum to remain alive and produce milk. She's not going to grow or do anything herself. That's absolute minimum. That's where the 13, sorry, that's where the 15, 18 kgs of dry matter plus start to become. That's what she needs to really power on. 13 kilos of dry matter is about 15 kilos of hay. 29 kilos of silage because of its dry matter percentage. If you're someone who's paying, and remember I'm talking about fully feeding a cow-calf unit at the moment here, hay at 500 a tonne, that's $7.50 per cow-calf unit per day. Um, if you're feeding half-grain hay, um, grain at, well, that was when grain was 500 a tonne. There you go, I haven't updated that slide <laughs> that bit recently, but at hay, um, you're still talking $5.50 a head a day. The minute we take that, well, take that calf off is an energy advantage, the equivalent of giving that cow two to three kilos of grain. The minute that lactational demand's gone, it's like you've just gone out and said, here's two to three kilos of grain a day. And that's purely because we reduce her energy and protein demand. So all of a sudden, she comes back down to that 7% protein. She can come back between or if she's at eight megajoules of energy, or even back to seven, between seven and eight kilos. So not only does she eat less, so we've gone from 13 kilos a day back to basically 7.7 .7 for her. So if you were now feeding this cow, even at hay at that 500 a ton, we're back at $4.40. So you've saved $3.10 for the cow unit. And then I'll come around to the calves afterward. Um, there's some prices there, but I guess the concept with the pricing is it depends on what you're paying for feed that you're feeding that cow-calf unit. But that's the big message. The minute that calf goes is the energy and protein and feed reduction. Um, all of a sudden, these cows often, based on what people are feeding them, stop losing weight and begin to go forward. There is, of course, a feed cost associated with the calf, which when I get to the various size calves, I'll, I'll talk about that as well. When should you early wean? Look at the body condition of the cows. They're telling you absolutely everything you need to know. But don't forget to look in the paddock and see what's around them and underneath them as well. This here is a cow, fat score one, down to zero to two mil. She's lean, calf at foot, not much paddock feed in front of her you take it off there to prevent any further body condition decline, or you obviously have to start feeding that unit a lot more. And you want to be well before here. Here we've got a calf that's probably six and a half, seven months old. She is down in that, what we call high risk category, that if something isn't changed soon, she, she could find herself in a sad, lonely place. When it comes to the calf, People often say, well, how young? And what this is coming back to is basically the main thing you've got to look for is that rumen development. It must be developed and functioning. And people say, well, how do you do that? And this, you can't see in the pictures there, but basically 
Under normal paddock conditions, a calf will have a functioning rumen by three months of age. And why that is, it mimics its mother, it walks around, it ingests rumen bugs from the, care, the other, like the adults as it's walking around grazing, grooming and so forth. Um, the milk from mum's its main energy protein, but then the bit of grass or grain or whatever you might have out for them, that begins to stimulate the rumen development to grow the papillae in the rumen. In a drought conditions, we often see it can be a bit younger, down to two months. And why that is, often cows don't have as much milk underneath them. People tend to be hand feeding. Calves mimic their mothers. They'll come through and they'll start to eat and mimic their mothers. So you can see calves starting um, to have a, a developed rumen a lot sooner. It's especially the case if there's been hand feeding going on from when the calf was born. However, the trap is for, in some situations, people didn't start hand feeding or they weren't feeding soon enough and the paddocks were bare. If that calf's born and only has milk, it'll take longer to develop a rumen because there's no fibrous material coming into that rumen to help it develop. So in those cases, it's really a case of thinking about, well, what, what feeding situation have these calves been exposed to? Signs of rumen development is just visually watch them. See them walking about with their heads down, grazing. They often get that little bit of a pot belly kind of look if they're doing it tough. That's a sign they're getting more, they're trying to nibble. Um, so in effect, their rumen is at the point where it's going to be able to digest and handle feed you provide to them when, when they're weaned and mum's removed. Forward planning for feed supply this year is critical. All I'm meaning there is it's huge demand to get hold of feed when you need it. You need to forward plan, you need to talk your feed supplier. There were people um, found themselves in a bit of a tricky situation. They just thought they'd just ring up and get feed and they were told oh, it could be two to three weeks before it gets here. If you do wean calves, think about how many you've got, how much feed, and make sure they keep it coming to you. Coming over Christmas, New Year, I'm told, I'm told that the feed mills are only gonna be having public holidays off, but still think about what that could mean for feed supply. It might be a case of you better to have it in the shed if you can, opposed to waiting and relying on them to turn up. Um, be careful mixing feed from different suppliers. In some cases, rural stores have been able to get feed, but it's been made from a Riverina mill or an Orco mill, and it's not the normal mix. Different feed mills use different ingredients. Um, based on the ingredients, there's been cases of people have had calves or cows, cattle that have been on a grain bin for a significant period of time, went out and they're all sick and crook with grain poisoning the next day. It's to do with the change in diets that rapid because the feed feeder ran out and they dropped a different mixture. Some might have had more wheat in it, which was the case in this, this situation. That mill was using more wheat. The other one was still based around more sorghum, more starch, same intake, same everything. They went and started to go down with grain poisoning. So. Be careful if you're mixing. If you've got a mix, try and shandy it in. Don't let the feeder run empty and then throw them straight onto, oh, well, this is all I could get, so this will do, and treat it the same. Um, try and shandy it in if you've got a mix, or if you've got to completely change, slow them down on the day that they get the new product just until you make sure that they're, they've adjusted. Feed for growth and not maintenance. Now, this is for early weaned calves. How well that early weaned calf is gonna depend entirely on the quality of diet it gets how de developed and functioning its rumen is when you, when you started, and we'll talk more when we get into those. Basically, the minimum target growth rates, calves, if they're under more or less 0.6 of a kilo. If you early wean the calf, you wanna try and get them doing 0.6 of a kilogram a day. Why that's important is for two things, animal welfare, but I'll also do a costing exercise shortly with that. People who say they early wean a calf and it does a kilo a day, very lucky. Don't do your budgets on, I'm going to early wean these calves and they're going to keep doing a kilo a day. What we're talking about here is nursing some breeder cattle through this. What are we going to do with the calves? And it's a basically, we want to look, we're looking at the business dynamics going forward, not just, um, you know, we'll spend a fortune on them and push them harder and harder. We're trying to balance feed cost as well for the calf. Higher the growth rate you chase in these younger calves, the more cost. So you can attempt to chase higher growth rates and some calves, especially as they get older, will do better than 0.6 a day. But if you're paying 600 odd a ton for that feed, we're starting to need to think about what's our feed cost? How do we balance that feed cost in the current market um, going forward as well? Yep.
Yeah. So I'm just about to jump into the different the different classes by different weights because different weights, yeah, their nu nutritional demands are a bit different. So, so this is just a quick costing on why growth and not maintenance. Now, bear in mind I'm talking to some extreme situations here. So, say you've taken a calf off and he's 100 kilos live weight. We want to get at least 50 kilos live weight. Let's assume he's going to dress 52 percent. So it'll be 150 kilos. By the time he dresses, comes out at 78 kilos. He's in the bottom end of the veal grid. And what we're talking about is why I'm saying this is extreme. We're going to get them to that weight, kill them, get rid of them to stop spending money on them because we're still trying to hold We've still got the breeders there, potentially. So I believe that's dropped from 330 to 320 if anyone hasn't seen the local grid, <coughs> NCMC. Um, 78 kilo cargs at three dollars is only 257 dollars a head. Now there's not there's no not a lot of joy and not a lot of money in that. To get 50 kilos, if we do 0.6 a day, it's 84 days. Two and a half kilos of grain for that that size calf, dollar fifty a day. 126 dollars goes in feed. In that time, you start to deduct that. You only got 257. Take out the 126. There's not a lot of margin in it, but remember we're talking about trying to just get them somewhere, because the other thing is people say, oh, well, I won't feed them as much, so I'll just basically maintain them, call it 0.2 a day. They cut the grain back to one and a half kilos, same price, ends up costing them, oh, it's only 90 cents a day, but by the time they actually get to that saleable or more marketable weight, it's 250 days, they've spent $225 on feed, all of a sudden, by the time you pay your levies, transport and everything, no money in them. And you've, you've put up with all the effort. The key message is with early wean calves, 90% of the cost and effort is in achieving maintenance. The little bit of cost above that production is where you can get them moving and get rid of them. Uh, keep, sorry, keep popping up there. The old, oh yeah, she'll be right, I'll just wean them. I'll just stop, just maintain them, let them, it'll rain and I'll just put them out in the paddock then might work, but if there's 84 days and they're only doing 0.2 of a kilo, they're only going to be 117 kilos, it still cost you $76. They're not in a marketable price grid. In that case, you're sweating on widespread rain somewhere and the market will lift. So I guess all I'm trying to say, there, there's a number of strategies you can take. Why I say feed for production, at least it's getting them to an end point where you can, if it's still bad across the eastern, eastern seaboard, you can get them in the market, kill them and they're gone. Um, otherwise, you land down here and it still hasn't rained. All of a sudden, you start running into spending all this money. They're not really marketable. Now, what have I do? You, you're just eroding that margin. Um, a lot of people have been getting down into this realm or looking at that was going to end up being their scenario because of cash flow. They're better off just, just sell them and get, get rid of them now. Don't even attempt to start it. Um, calves younger than six weeks. Only one place has had to do this this year, and it was a big place and they were fire affected. Under six weeks of age, treat them as if they don't have a functioning rumen. The only way you can wean them is basically milk powder and high quality calf pellets. Too much hard work, I wouldn't recommend doing it. Most people I would suggest try and feed the cow calf unit or consider just selling those calves as little bobbies. Not that they're marketable either, but just too much hard work. Um, in anything that young, to be honest, to be practical. Calves two to four months old, or probably more, most importantly, 80 to 120 kilos. Obviously, you can sell them. Not saying there's a lot of joy in that, but calves in that age br bracket ideally need 18 to 20% crude protein in their diet and 13 megajoules of energy. Um, protein source needs to be a true protein to make sure it's not being driven by urea and it's all to do with still that rumen development. Um, they're still very young to be, have enough rumen development to handle urea, so a true protein, canola meal, palm kernel meal, etc. One and a half to two and a half kgs of grain per day with ad-lib hay if you can find it. Um, people are making their own mixes with loose and chaff, crushed grain, depending where they're getting that from. Comes out a bit more cost effective. Um, you can get crushed grain, some protein meal such as canola meal, 
Um, same thing, plus 10 kgs of hay and feed at two to two and a half kilos per head per day. Again, this is geared around only doing that 0.6 a day. If you want to do more, you could offer them more, they will eat a bit more. Um, just depends on where you're at. But again, we're talking about 80 to 120 kilo calves there. Calves five and six months old, this becomes a lot easier, or 120 kilos plus. Selling them for some people, if you're not up to set, not set up to feed, probably a more practical and potentially easier. You can come back to 14 to 16%, your feedlot meals, pellets that most of our mills do. Energy levels around the same. Try and keep true protein source, but those molasses urea mixes with reasonable quality hay achieve okay results. Um, nowhere near as good as the grain. These guys are likely to eat between two and a half and four kilos a day. Um, so when you start getting calves at this point, you've got to start thinking, well, if, they're, if I'm letting them eat four kilos a day, that's $2.40 a calf a day. Plus, if I'm still feeding the cow, combine the two costs. Um, would I be better in, in that situation, provided that you could feed the cow creep feeding a calf, as opposed to splitting the unit? Um, all depends on the feed situation for the, the actual adult cow, what, what you've got to do to be supplying her feed. Um, Ideally, you would use 16% protein pellets, but most, you know, most of the rations that are around the north coast are geared around 14%. Um, if you find any of those calves or some of the tail end are struggling, um, you can put 100 grams a day of protein meal on top of it for them. We'll, we'll bump them up a bit better, but um, again, it's all about balancing the, the cost aspect of it there. If you're weaning them, Troughs, if they're single-sided, allow about 30, 30 odd centimetres for those slightly older, a bit narrow, a bit less for when they're younger. Double-sided, 15 centimetres. Self-feeders, five to five to seven centimetres. That's more for your, your younger little calves or if you're creep feeding, 10 to 15 centimetres because these are calves, they're basically weaned into a yard. They're more or less confined to a point. Um, you don't want to just wean them and let them out in the back paddock, they spend all day running around the paddock, burn all their energy, energy off. Um, that might stop now. Uh, hay racks, ideally, use, if you are buying hay, put it in a hay rack to avoid wastage. It's dear enough as it is without um, watching it, just calves especially, go and lay in it and walk all over it. Try and avoid overhead hay racks. Why? Seeing a lot of pink eye this year in young, early weaned calves. They're in, under enough stress, immune suppression. They put, stick their heads up into an overhead hay rack. The dust falls down into the eyes. The eyes begin to weep or irritate. Flies, bacterial infection, and then you got that on top of it. Weaning, good water. Only thing I really stress, people have weaned calves and they're little babies and they can't quite get their heads over and back down into water troughs, so just make sure they can reach the water trough that you've got there for them. Um, biggest message, regardless of any livestock size, Reduce water intake will reduce feed intake. If the water source is a bit off or a bit dicey, they won't drink as much, they won't go and eat as much. Um, it's just a simple fact, they need that liquid going through their, their system. Um, so just take care of the water. Yards, how much room? Um, if they're up to 100 kilos, two and a half square metres a head's fine. Um, 100 to 200 kilos, three to four square metres is enough. Um, if you're putting shade up, try and have it above, not to the side, because you want that wind flow through, keeps them cooler. Um, mud, well, there used to be the joke, if you wanted to rain wean calves on the north coast, so if, if that makes it rain, I'll, have, <laughs> I'll give it a go. But um, just think about, you know, obviously, if we do get a couple of storms come over and you've got bigger numbers in yards, um, is there another pen you can move them to? Um, eventually, yes, once they're all eating and feeding well, you can let them out. Um, back into a paddock um, in time. Try and segregate them on size, depending on your program. If you've got bigger calves, you know, five, six month old calves, 100 odd kilos, they're gonna be the garbage guts. They're gonna take all the feed over the little three month old calf if you're taking them all off. So try and put like with like. Question around marking. If you're going to do it and you haven't marked, branded, etc. Uh, try and do it two weeks before you take these calves off. They're going to be under enough stress losing mum. You don't want to throw um, castration, etc., on top of it. 
or delay it until you know they're settled down onto their feed um, and beginning to gain weight. Uh, any shy feeders that, or ones that appear sick, just pull them out to a hospital pen themselves. Um, Health-wise, you're five in one at the bare minimum, um, especially if they've been in a, a pretty tough paddock, um, mainly for that pulpy kidney um, aspect if they haven't already had it. Drenching, um, again, depends on your enterprise, would be advisable, it is another cost, but they often, if they've been out, heads down, grazing lower to the ground, going to have ingested more worms than in a, a better season. So consider all of those things. Um, ADE, we are seeing clinical vitamin A deficiency um, or night blindness in and around casino. The cattle have been that long without green feed in young calves, particularly. Um, not saying you'll be seeing that up here, but those types of products, you know, speak with your vet or, or someone relative to your situation um, in that cert circumstance. Question around creep feeding creep feeding is not weaning. I can't stress that enough. The main advantage of creep feeding is to the calf. You're not reducing the feed demand on that cow at all. Yes, the calf goes and eats some grain, but while ever that cow is producing milk, she's biologically fixed. While ever there's that suckling stimulus, she'll continue to produce milk. While ever she's lactating and producing milk, her energy, protein, and water demands remain higher than if she's dried off completely. The only way a cow receives significant benefit from creep feeding, her, so this is the cow now herself, is if she has enough feed and enough good quality feed to ideally meet or exceed her demands. So in a normal year, often you see people creep feed, the cows are mud fat, calves are fat. Well, yep, the cow would be getting a benefit then because she's not having to, she's keeping more energy for herself because She's got the feed there to do it. If she's standing on a barren paddock like that and you're not feeding her but the calf's on a creep bin, the cow's not getting any advantage. She's still going to be gradually dragged down. Um, creep feeding, best bit, makes early weaning or weaning far more easier. Often the calves are more marketable straight out of the paddock. You don't have to go through that whole early weaning process. Often you've got some that'll, well, the tops can go straight on the truck. Um, people say, I put the creep bin out for two weeks and then sold them. Geez, it made a difference. Answer is scientifically impossible. It takes about six weeks before calves will show significant measurable benefit. Um, just because they're standing there eating, it takes four weeks for that rumen to adapt. So if they haven't seen grain before, throw them on a bin for a couple of weeks. Um, nowhere near as measurable, ben as measurable benefit is at least six weeks. So just factoring that in. You can make your own adjustable creep gates for those who are feeding. That's just simply those pipe fittings. You just get round pipe, you can cut and adjust them, you can tighten them, fix them in the paddock. Uh, anyone who runs F1 or Brahman cows, there's always one that seems to find a way of getting inside the creep gate, and it's never fun to get out. Um, in that situation, you can just undo the panels or widen them, narrow them. Um, just a, yeah, a handy tool I've seen um, as I've travelled about this year. At the end of the day, you can pack them up and put them away um, as well if you don't want to creep feed going forward. Other information, there is a managing and preparing for drought. That's both online. Um, unfortunately, I'm out of hard copies and they're on back order, I think, still with DPI. But there's that drought hub and there's a lot of that information um, about the drought maps, forecasts, feeding. There's links. It's a really good resource um, moving forward. And, Season will change, we'll all learn from our experiences and many of you up here would remember the Debbie flood. Well, that was, that was my low country the day after the Debbie flood. I was sitting in a canoe wondering, yeah, well, probably swearing more at the rain, but I think I'll uh, learn to take that back <laughs> in the current season, that's for sure. But um, yeah, so it's a very quick run through, but I'll be around over lunch and after if there's any questions. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so, what are some of the key reasons to increase soil carbon in our pasture? Well, soil carbon is really important for our soils and for our pasture health. So, soil carbon helps 
chemical fertility, so they're breaking down of organic carbon by microbes releases nutrients for our pastures. We're actually going to see a lot of that after the drought breaks. We're going to see a big pulse of nitrogen coming down from microbes breaking it down and releasing it for us. The second um, is your biological fertility. So it is the food source for so many microbes and other soil, soil organisms in the soil. And the more active the beneficial ones are, the less active the, the nasty ones are that in your soil. Uh, the other one is uh, structural fertility of your soil. So organic carbon gives your soil the ability and the resilience to have good structure. So it reduces compaction and reduces, uh, or helps the soil aggregate increases soil moisture holding capacity which is only going to be good and we want to be in the upward spiral coming out of this drought that is that most of these soil carbon comes from root systems we want good root systems so that we've got more organic matter stock going in uh, and so that we're going up instead of going down having less material there and more long-term problems with our soils soil the soil holds moisture uh, depending on the macropores and the micropores in the soils. Uh, so more organic matter gives you more micropores where soil, the macropores is where the water drains, whereas the micropores are where soil water is stored. And um, clay can have two smaller micropores that are really hard for plants to extract. Organic matter helps with clays to make them the water more available, but it also helps with sand, which has too many macropores and so drains well but doesn't hold a lot of moisture. So some of the ways to increase soil carbon is, well, the biggest source of carbon in the soil is from, uh, is from root systems. That's the biggest stock. So organic matter is decomposing organic material. That could be animal, can be plants, but the biggest source is the root systems. So it's important to understand your soil and work out what is limiting the root systems. Now it could be as simple as compaction and so that uh, there's not going to be a big root system there, there's not going to be a lot of organic matter going into the soil. It could be uh, the pH is too low, it could be there's waterlogging, it could be uh, that it's a hard setting soil. There's all these factors that could be limiting it. If you, every time you dig a fence pole, a fence pole, a fence hole, uh, have a look down and um, see where the root systems are going, uh, see what the soil is like underneath. Uh, and try and work that out. It could be a nutrient deficiency as well, so soil testing can be really useful to, to work that out. Uh, and you can always put out strip tests on your property to work out what's going to respond so that the healthier your pasture is, the healthier the root systems, the healthier the uh, amount of organic carbon stock going in. Now of that organic material going in, 10% is kept. You know, it goes to the long-term humus sort of form, but that can take hundreds of years to get to that stage. So, but we need that cycle to be continuing all the time so that there's a release of nutrients as well as all the benefits of organic carbon. So the management activities that we can do to increase beyond uh, looking and fixing up soil limitations, we could put in, do fast remediation, such as uh, using a high organic carbon product as our fertiliser source or as an amendment. So biochar and chicken litter are both ones of those, but research those carefully before you start using them. Uh, but otherwise it's, it's about managing your fertility. Uh, not, too much nitrogen can actually lead to a faster decomposition of your organic matter. So overuse of nitrogen can also uh, lead to lower organic carbon. Mind you, a good system with lots and lots of clover could lead to lots of nitrogen. So have a grass in the system to combat it so that the, there's um, organic carbon going back in. That, and plant material that can use the uh, nitrogen you've added. The other barrier that could be in your soil is just low phosphorus. So we know that phosphorus is really good for root systems. Some of the cropping work has shown that if we put a, um, some phosphorus in the soil here and they've done soil x-rays and there's these root systems going completely mad around where, this, where the um, phosphorus was and then down here not so many roots and up here not so many roots. So we know that phosphorus really stimulates root growth and most of our soils in Australia are deficient in phosphorus so getting our phosphorus right 
or whatever else or whatever is deficient in our soils, but phosphorus is one of the big ones. The question's asked if um, grazing management can help. Absolutely, because grazing management, rotation and rest of pasture helps the root systems, uh, helps the plant's recovery phase. Uh, if you keep on set stocking all the time, the plant uses up its energy stores that it has in the crown or in the uh, top of the root system. And if it doesn't have that, it takes it longer to come back. Now that longer to come back is less time able to convert sunlight into energy. So resting pasture is really important for the pasture's sake, but also long-term carbon. Where do you see yourself in five years time? Still doing this and uh, probably not this video thing, but, <laughs> but still doing cattle. Like I love it, mum and dad love it. Um, I don't know if the kids will take it on. Like it's hard going, if you don't love farming, it's no use being in it, it's too hard and uh, it's too crushing. But um, if you do love it, it's, it's so easy and if you're passionate about it, it's a lovely, lovely game to be in. Well there you have it guys. We've had a great day out here at Crystal Creek and we've learned a lot of great things about how to look after our pastures in the drought. Make sure you check out our website uh, for all the latest information about the project and to find out more information about some of these resources.